From time to time, we will share with you one of the more intriguing exhibits that can be found within the museums of Giza. Beyond the mountainous displays of precious jewels and finely cast golden relics, which captivate the crowds who flock to experience this extremely rich history, we personally find the more valuable of objects are often overlooked. Indeed, these precious masks and past pharaoh's possessions are undoubtedly exquisite in nature. However, there are some objects, never designed to stun or impress, but built with a function. Functions which could shed light on the most intriguing and mysterious aspects of this past civilization. The Khufu ship being but one of these said artifacts. A boat found disassembled under the Great Pyramid, once said to have floated through the sky. And although the physical idea of this ship actually flying is a leap too far for some, there is, in fact, an artifact which exists found in 1898 during an excavation of the Padi Ayman tomb in Saqqara, Egypt, which you may find a bit more practically designed for flight through the Egyptian skies. Although numerous sources over the past century have surfaced accusing Egyptian authorities of concealing the discovery of Vimanas, ancient flying machines, within the pyramids of Giza, our said artifact seems to have slipped through this net of secrecy. Often with these well-stocked and well-preserved tombs, resting places of past pharaohs, whom once possessed unimaginable riches, numerous toy models of their once favored crafts and vessels will be discovered, exquisitely constructed miniature replicas of their favorite forms of travel. It seems this artifact may have indeed been filtered through the security netting of public paradigm. As doing so, it seems to have lost its tailplane. Known as the Saqqara bird, it is now largely thought by many to have been a replica of an ancient flying craft, more specifically a glider. Clearly inspired by a bird's flight, the fixed wing upon its back has been found to be perfectly angled to create lift. Egyptian physician, archaeologist, parapsychologist and dowser Khalil Messia has concluded that the ancient Egyptians developed the first aircrafts. Predictably, he has experienced considerable hostility regarding his expose of evidences. One particular effort was undertaken by a character known as Martin Gregory, a builder and designer of free-flight gliders. He apparently built an exact replica of the Saqqara bird made of balsa wood. After testing this replica, Gregory would conclude that the Saqqara bird never flew. He told the interested parties that it was totally unstable in flight. Even after a tailplane was fitted, he claimed that the glider's performance was disappointing. He finished by concluding that the Saqqara bird was probably made as a child's toy or a weather vane. This clear attempt to suppress the truth, however, failed, and Martin has since been proven to have lied regarding the abilities of the glider. The question is why did he lie? According to Messia's son, Dawood Khalil Messia, a successful architect who has thankfully continued the work of his father, Gregory's suggestion that the Saqqara bird was a weather vane is impossible due to the lack of markings or any holes on the model that would serve as a means of hanging it. Additionally, and most importantly, aerodynamics expert Simon Sanderson also tested a replica model in a wind tunnel without a tailplane and found that it produced four times the glider's own weight and lift. In Liverpool University, Sanderson then subjected it to another, more powerful wind tunnel, this time after adding the missing tail. He stated that the Saqqara bird actually flew quite well, clearly to the annoyance of certain people who are probably now regretting not seizing the entire artifact some years ago, rather than just the tail plane. Over 2,000 years after the ancient Egyptians carved this mysterious bird, modern technology has proven beyond doubt that at full size, it could have indeed once flown through the Egyptian skies. A number of people who frequent our work have requested a more detailed video regarding one of the mysteries we so often focus upon here on the channel. There are many sites that we feel are deserving of in-depth focus. Our mission has always been to enlighten those who may not have been aware of the many different, compelling, and often controversial realities surrounding countless ancient ruins that throughout their lives have been explained away with a lie. Undoubtedly, 
the most well-known, most commonly explored, and thus the ruin most suited for our viewers' acquirement of a knowledge armory is Giza. Indeed, there are many people you will meet throughout your life that will have delved into the mysteries of Egypt. However, this experience, unbeknownst to them, may have been fraught with a limited, illogical, academic account regarding the history of Giza's plateau. This video, then, is our gift to our viewer. To prove to all those who act like they know it all how little they actually do. The characteristics of the casing stones are undoubtedly one of our own most noted achievements. We feel little, if any, notice has been given to the facts we have realized regarding these stones. Yet, the evidence we have found will remain clear for all to see. These casing stones, although of an enormous size and as such were left by a lost civilization, are far younger than the sandstone in which they encase. Most of these casing stones, unfortunately robbed out during invasions within the last few centuries, are protecting stones which are actually far more eroded and thus far older beneath. However, additionally, we began to wonder just how old could the Great Pyramids be? Could these eroding sandstones actually be concealing a far larger, far older structure beneath? Also discovered here on our channel the supporting evidence to this hypothesis, most notably along the east side of Khufu and in numerous other places where the smaller sandstones have been robbed out, is, as we suspected, a far larger exoskeleton. We strongly believe these enormous megalithic blocks that we have previously estimated to be many hundreds of tons in weight are actually the original oldest blocks of the pyramids. We also believe that the more modern, currently recognized casing stones were actually inspired by these more heavily eroded smaller sandstone blocks, now concealing these mammoth megaliths. This makes the layers we believe that adorn the Great Pyramid numbers three, with the two more modern layers being conservation efforts, undoubtedly undertaken at vastly different times within history. Just how old is the Great Pyramid? just how impressive was ancient Egypt. For example, the oldest surviving obelisk at Heliopolis, and therefore in Egypt, was undeniably cut, transported, and lifted into position at an unknown time in history, using now lost technology and knowledge. It is a stone 20 meters in height, weighing an astonishing 121 tons. And this enormous, unexplainable, impossible monolith is not the only one left upon the plateau. There are many more dotted all over Giza. For example, the sarcophagus of Amenemet III, a pair of quartzite monoliths, discovered in the early 20th century, hang above this supposed tomb. These gigantic stones effortlessly support the weight above, each estimated to weigh 110 metric tons. The Colossi of Memnon, these two gigantic artworks were built from single pieces of stone. They are orientated toward the sunrise at winter solstice, estimated to weigh anywhere from 600 to 1,000 tons each. Modern technology allows for the movement of such weights. However, any civilization claimed by academia, actually once being responsible for the transportation of such stones, is absurd. Who could have possibly transported such enormous stones to these locations? Not only transported them, but worked them into masterpieces they once were, disposing of all waste, presumably also weighing many tons. And there are many others. In the temple east of Khafre's Pyramid, for example, there lay blocks regularly, yet quietly estimated to weigh over 400 tons. How can modern academia claim such tasks were undertaken by our modern ancestors. Anyone aware of the true accomplishments involved in the construction of the Giza Plateau must now see this hypothesis as severely lacking any satisfactory explanations. Mortuary Temple of Menkaura still possesses some astonishing unexplained feats. There are some estimates of the blocks within the temple, most notably within the surviving walls of the mortuary, weighing as much as 220 tons. The heaviest granite ashlars, 
imported from Aswan Quarry many miles away, weighing in at more than 30 tons. There are many incredible, inexplicable features upon the Giza Plateau. Many of them, unfortunately, yet predictably, little shared academically. Yet it remains a place of invaluable existent truths, many discrediting that which are passed off as current academic fact. Giza is an astonishing place, and the one we feel most likely to expose academia once and for all. It is a plateau we find highly compelling. When one explores the most fascinating and ancient of structures resting all over our planet, you will inevitably be confronted by baffling feats on engineering and ingenuity, tasks that to modern man escape understanding or indeed explanation. The main consensus regarding these ancient structures has always been a tricky thing to explain. To claim that these marvelous structures were built by primitive people with only primitive tools at their disposal does not only seem absurd to most who have visited such sites, but ignorant of their true past grandeur and the specific characteristics of each of these places. Ancient sites, such as Giza, Machu Picchu, among many others, still contain very confusing artifacts, anomalous evidence, which tells a very different story to that of mainstream history. Apart from the Baghdad battery, largely claimed to have been an ancient form of electroplating, there has been little in the way of physical evidence to suggest the use of electricity within the academically researched ancient times. Yet, there are many remnants left which suggest such activities. Not only are there countless clear examples of past machine work stone, but most importantly, there is evidence of errors made by these same tools, misstarts and discovered fault lines, these particular stones discarded, laid bare in the quarries, revealing all the hallmarks of the machine engineering that went into building these wonderful places, these artifacts, once rubbish, now historical treasures. They can tell you the shape and movements of the tools that were being used, showing just how these machines cut into the stones, core drillings also discarded during manufacture, and cut stones discarded due to faults and cracks, revealing the complete preliminary cut marks left by the ancient stone cutters. These fragments of past activities are clearly some of the most important in unraveling these sites' ultimate secrets, yet it is rarely shared in the public arena and even less frequently researched by official bodies. Along with this vast and perplexing array of remnants, mercilessly left where they fell, strewn amongst the debris of disruption, lay countless extremely hardy machine stone jars, vessels made from some of the hardest rocks on Earth. Some of these jars were made with a round bottom, perfectly machined, balanced on a base no bigger than the tip of a chicken's egg. Sir William Flinders Petrie ultimately realized that only lathe turning could have produced the symmetry and balance found on thousands of these bowls and vases. And Petrie was no fool. In 1894, he founded his own archaeological body, the Egyptian Research Account, which later became the British School of Archaeology in Egypt. He stated, for example, a bowl maker attained curves of exact circularity by rotating the bowl around a fixed blade and formed a lip by shifting the centering of the bowl. Another round-bottom vase had walls of such uniform thickness that it balanced perfectly on a curved base. To have a very well-respected researcher and specialist of the ancient Egyptians to admit to a conviction of the use of power tools in these pots construction seems like quite a stunning position to take especially when one considers that while metal chisels could have been used to shape soft limestone within ancient Egyptian times, the metals that were available to them – copper, bronze, and during the first millennium BCE, wrought iron – were far too soft to work such rock into such exquisite designs. It seems Petri would like to remain honest regarding his conclusions, yet also incomplete with his explanations preferring to let the receiver of said information make their own realizations, preferring to avoid complication by a, by this time, rather visible enemy. One could only conclude that these relics and ancient monuments thereof were not the work of the Egyptians. 
but further evidence to suggest that these baffling structures were built far before the ancient Egyptians, before academic understandings, by a highly technologically advanced pre-cataclysm civilization. We find it difficult to see how such work was undertaken, or an explanation for our finding can be made without the use of power tools. Thankfully, the more we learn regarding these enigmatic places, the more we become aware of regarding their true history, and the closer, it seems, we become to finding those who built them.
Hi guys, have you ever heard of Dendera Temple? Known as the sixth gnome of Upper Egypt, it is one of the best preserved ancient temple complexes on earth, and it bears the scars of what must have been the most frightening and destructive of events. An event that is ignored by the majority of modern academia. The complex spans some 40,000 square feet, and within the temple is some of the most well-preserved ancient artworks of anywhere in Egypt. Along with preserving the exquisite art and decorations, the temple also preserved evidence of something we were not taught about in history class. Upon the granite steps, which still lead to the temple's roof, in direct alignment with a small window cut into the thick stone wall, is evidence of severe melting. At one time in the temple's long life, the steps within were turned into liquid magma. What catastrophic event could lead to the melting of granite steps through a small window in the wall? Were such events commonplace, or was it the result of an accident? Is this why the ancient structures were built with such huge blocks of stone? Many have speculated that the Dendora Temple is built upon an even older site. Are the steps surviving remnants of this much earlier complex? Were they part of a structure that once witnessed a solar flare, perhaps, or maybe a localized supernova? Many who have examined the steps and the surrounding area have speculated that nuclear blasts may have been detonated within ancient Egypt, or even before. The ancient site in India, for example, 10 miles west of Jodhpur, with radiation that was so intense the area is still highly dangerous. An ancient layer of radioactive ash was discovered that covers a three square mile area. Scientists investigating the site where a housing development was being built established that there was a very high rate of illnesses in the area. The levels of radiation were so high the Indian government eventually cordoned off the entire area. They later unearthed an ancient city, which shows strong evidence of an atomic blast dating back some 12,000 years, which destroyed most of the buildings and killed an estimated half a million people. Did nuclear war occur in our distant past? Were these ancient structures which have stood the test of time actually built as bunkers? With melted steps and irradiated ancient cities found throughout the world, the evidence is certainly compelling. As always, thanks for watching guys, until next time, take care. The temple also preserved evidence of something we were not taught about in history class. 
Upon the granite steps, which still lead to the temple's roof, in direct alignment with a small window cut into the thick stone wall, is evidence of severe melting. At one time in the temple's long life, the steps within were turned into liquid magma. What catastrophic event could lead to the melting of granite steps through a small window in the wall? Were such events commonplace, or was it the result of an accident? Is this why the ancient structures were built with such huge blocks of stone? Many have speculated that the Dendora Temple is built upon an even older site. Are the steps surviving remnants of this much earlier complex? Were they part of a structure that once witnessed a solar flare, perhaps, or maybe a localized supernova? Many who have examined the steps and the surrounding area have speculated that nuclear blasts may have been detonated within ancient Egypt, or even before. In 1988, while in Egypt, hunting for ancient relics, Swiss archaeologist, Gregor Spree, would stumble across a once-in-a-lifetime find. After paying a handsome fee of $300 to be allowed to inspect a grave robber's collection, he would be handed a package, wrapped in rags, and apparently with quite a musky odor. Within, he would discover an enormous mummified finger. It measured an amazing 16 inches in length, resulting in height estimates of 16 plus feet, for the original owner of such a monstrous digit. Spree recounted the moment he laid eyes on the finger to a local press newspaper, when he released the photos to the public. Quote, I was allowed to take it in hand and also to take pictures. A bill was put next to it to get an idea of its enormous size. The bent finger was split open and covered with dried mold. It was surprisingly light, maybe a few hundred grams, my heart was in my throat. Some believe the finger may have belonged to an extinct prehistoric giant ape, but alas, like so many other artifacts of this nature, subsequently vanished, shortly after it gained public attention. Also the ape in question died out hundreds of thousands of years ago, and a digit of this ancient animal has never been found, we have only ever found small bone fragments and teeth. Imagine then the odds of finding a fully mummified finger from the animal within a tomb raider's collections in Egypt. They are probably quite slim. Also leaving the question as to how it ended up mummified in Egypt a tough one to answer. He returned to Egypt in 2009 compelled to learn more about it, but unfortunately, by then, the old man who allowed Spory to take the pictures had vanished, and with him all traces of the mysterious finger. If there was found to indeed have been a race of giant, highly intelligent humans that colonized ancient Egypt, it would help tremendously in explaining the construction of the pyramids.